Welcome back. Um, glad to see all of you here. Uh, for those of you who attended Joel or, or saw Joel Gruce's talk before, it was an excellent setup for my talk um, in that I'm trying to push back against some of the things he hates about notebooks um, and, and solve some of those challenges that he, he put out there. Um, the official title of the talk is Supporting Reproducibility in Jupiter Through Dataflow Notebooks. Um, and something that's come up before is this idea that Jupyter Notebooks spans two different sort of styles of notebooks. Um, one of them you're probably familiar with if you've done notebooks. Um, you can identify them by the, the file names, untitled 1, untitled 27, untitled 152. Um, they often have things like errors in the middle, cells are executed out of order or not executed at all, things might be edited. Um, this is sort of what happens in explore, exploration, right? You're trying to test hypotheses, you're trying to load your data, you're trying to look at things. This is not uncommon. And this is something that Jupyter has good tools to support, right? It's a flexible environment. You can edit whatever cell you want, you can execute cells whenever you want in whatever order you want. Um, and I think one of the key things that I like about the notebook is the inline views of outputs. Right? So you create a plot, you create, generate some execution, you don't have to switch to another window to run that, you run it right in the notebook, you see the result right below the code that you wrote. Um, and along with this there are some execution shortcuts so that you can quickly um, run through things like running all the cells, running all above, running all below. On the other side we have explanatory work notebooks, right? Some, something that's sort of published or very presentable that you want a large audience to see, or at least the audience um, that's interested in your work. These can be identified by markdown cells, where you're actually documenting uh, like literate programming wants you to, um, nice short snippets of code where you can see logical progression in steps, um, and often they have these nice outputs, visual outputs, and in this case, interactive outputs. Right, so that you can not only just see what somebody did, but you can play around and change things out, look at the visualizations. And Jupyter has great support for this as well. Right? There's textual explanation, the fact that this literate programming idea allows you to combine markdown cells along with the code. Graphical explorations, you can have inline figures. Um, and this interactive exploration, right? Uh, explanation using Jupyter widgets so that it's not just something that's a stale document that you print and sort of read through but something that you can download and play around with and sort of explore your own hypothesis. Um, and along with that there's this idea of publishing, right? So you can take a notebook, convert it into a web page, convert it into LaTeX, um, etc. And generally these, these explanatory notebooks are clear with sort of a linear cell layout. Um, and this leads to what we like to talk about with notebooks is reproducibility, right? So if you have something that's nicely crafted, that has all these different features, it's often reproducible. Um, and, and it's due to this sort of classic uh, linear cell layout. So I've talked about two kinds of notebooks. There's clearly a spectrum, right? It's not just sort of these you know, one-off sort of, I'm gonna open an untitled notebook and do some stuff and these really nice polished published um, sort of notebooks. There's things in the middle, like when you want to share something with your colleagues or things like that. Uh, and this parallels a general approach to research, right? Sometimes you're trying to brainstorm questions, ideate very quickly, um, then you get to distilling the initial results into something understandable and verifiable. And then finally you get to sort of this published uh, step, where, published step where you're polishing the text um, and hopefully adding some interactivity to your notebooks as well. So one question here is, are these on totally separate ends of the world, right? Is there a way to go from rapid exploration to clear explanation, right? Yeah, I did my first notebook and then I sort of copied and pasted stuff and I refined it a bit and finally generated this nice published notebook. Um, how do we make that process simpler? How do we sort of um, make the rapid exploration lead to these clearer explanations? Uh, and this gets us back to the idea of reproducibility. Uh, and to clarify a little bit, um, science is very fond of sort of replicating experiments, right? So you have um, independent verification by separate labs that a particular hypothesis tests out um, in a particular way. Reproducibility, especially computational reproducibility, we're talking more, give me your code, give me your data, I can run that, I can check the results and sort of verify that. It's not the full start from the beginning, build everything from the ground up. Um, and in terms of notebooks, these are similar things to other computations in that we need to have an environment, 
that's, that's set up correctly, right? We have the right versions of libraries and packages. You can dig down very deep there. So it's not just the Python packages, but what C libraries you have, what operating system you're, you're going on, and things like that. Uh, and then on the data side, we need to have the necessary data, right? And things like making sure the data that was run originally with the notebook is the data that you downloaded. Uh, you can use hashing, data versioning. There are some solutions there. What I want to focus on is this last piece, which is really the execution. And you might sort of scratch your head and say, why, right? Execution, you just push a button and it runs basically, right? You have a Python script. You run that Python script. It executes. You get the results and you're done. Um, but with notebooks, it's not quite as simple, right? Because you can execute cells in whatever order you want. You can jump back, edit cells. Because of that flexibility, the execution isn't always as predictable, right? Hopefully, you can run things top down and it works. Um, but if you save something from maybe one of your rapid explorations where you executed one cell five times and then you went back and executed the top cell again, that can lead to problems in state and you may not be able to rerun the cells as intended. Um, so taking so one of these sort of notebooks that's less nice and turning it into something that's more explanatory, more polished, um, is sometimes referred to as maybe linearizing the notebook. Um, and Jake Vanderplas in some uh, materials on reproducible data analysis talks about making sure that your notebook runs straight from beginning to end. Um, there are other things involved in this, sort of polishing your notebook, rearranging, organizing, merging cells, collecting imports that are scattered across multiple cells and putting them all at the top adding the explanatory text, right? using the markdown features that, that are embedded in Jupyter Notebook. Um, and then sort of this last step is restart the kernel and run all. Make sure that when you do that, your notebook's good to go. You have this top-down execution. Um, I have seen a couple notebooks where there's sort of auxiliary code that people want to run first, and then you sort of go through the rest of the notebook. And this can be useful when you're dealing with something like NB Viewer. Right, where you want to output a notebook. You want somebody to sort of read your key conclusions at the top. You don't want to have pages of code that they have to scroll through to get to those interesting conclusions, to get to those visualizations. But going beyond sort of this idea of just clicking a button and having everything reproduce, um, I want to get into this idea of reuse. Right? So run all linear solutions can be great. Right? You know they're going to run. You can sort of scroll back and see what happened. But a question here is, can I actually understand how the original code works, right? Yeah, I can run it. Everything generates correctly. I don't see any exceptions. But what does it mean? Can I go back to my own code two years later and really understand and modify that? Or take one of these nicely published notebooks and, and sort of understand what's going on there? And so this also goes along with, like, do I actually know how to change the code for my own work, right? Can I, can I update things? It's not just rerunning something but it's making use of what's been published, what's out there. OK, so you know, that, that's important for, for reproducibility and sort of these nicer notebooks. But in these exploratory notebooks, you've run into these potholes probably, right? You redefined or mutated a variable, and you found out that you broke some other cell. Uh, maybe you went back to uh, some state before you were closing a notebook. Um, and and like it doesn't work after you closed it. You try to rerun the cells in top-down order, and it just doesn't work. Um, maybe you edited a cell and then forgot to run it, and you save that out and come back, came back to it a few months later, and go, why does it say x equals three, and the output says two? Right? This, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and these are things that people have um, you know noted in Jupyter and sort of run across. And um, for the most part, we've we found ways to get around these. Um, but it can be frustrating for some of the beginners. Um, and what seems to sort of, my, my idea of a solution for this is can we have better links between the cells? Can we sort of figure out what the dependencies between the cells are? Um, and in general, this is not an easy problem because you have variables floating all over the place. You can have uh, variables referenced all over the place. Um, but this is something that IPython has sort of thought about from the beginning. Um, Fernando Perez has sort of a comment on IPython that one of the goals was to hold state and capture previous results for reuse. Um, and so there are these sort of shortcuts that allow people to reference previous outputs, previous cells. Um, so you can reference a previous output using the out dictionary. Um, you pass in the number of the cell you want. You can grab that output and, and deal with it. There's also these sort of underscore shortcuts where whatever you last executed, the output from that cell is accessible. Um, and then you can also get things on the input side by looking at the transcript of all the executed code. 
So what was cell five when it was run, right? Maybe I deleted cell five and it became cell 27, but I can actually look what the code was when I ran, cell, uh, when I ran the cell when it was called cell five. Um, and then there's also this command, um, this magic command history, where you can get a list of all of everything that's sort of been run. Um, and so these commands exist in IPython. They migrated over to Jupyter Notebook and the IPy kernel. And it's not clear they're used that much in what we've seen, right? Um, and there are some reasons for that why they're not used that much in the notebook. So uh, what I'd like to show is a little demonstration. I'm loading some data, um, some soccer data about uh, sort of the top players in the world um, using pandas to parse that in via CSV file. Um, and then what's going to happen is I'm going to do some sort of massaging of the data, renaming things, doing a group by, looking at different con uh, countries. Um, I can try to find the USA players. It doesn't work. So I figure out that I have to actually strip off some of the white space to make things look correct. Um, and so now I created a new table. Um, and now the users can sort of use this updated data frame by using these out references, right? So these numeric references so that I can take the, the thing that I just created that I just saw as an output and use that further down. Now, if I go back and edit one of these cells, so in this case, I'm going to change the country USA to Sweden and look at the Swedish players that are in this top, uh, top soccer players list. And now what I'm going to do is I want to rerun that. I want to find sort of the mean rating of those players, right? It's fairly clear what it is here. But um, what happens is you see the result doesn't change. And it doesn't make any sense either, right? Because it says the, you know, the rating is 88. Both of those players actually have sort of a player rating that's below 88. So clearly, that can't be the mean. And the problem is that I'm referencing cell 7. And my cell, when I re-executed it, changed to output 9, right? So I would sort of have to go back and rewrite that code. Uh, so this underscore solution has a relative reference to the previously executed cell's output. Um, so this is a little more relative. Um, I can deal with things like this easier. If I change something and re-execute it, oh, it might have worked, except that the reference to the previously executed cell is actually below. It's not the thing above like you might expect if you read the top-down notebook. It's something that was actually above. Um, and so that can also introduce problems because it's the previously executed cell, not the previous cell in how you look at the notebook. So the solution that most people use is using variables, right? To find a variable like C, you know what C is going to be. Um, and you can use that in the rest of your analysis so that if you update anything about what C is, you can sort of uh, take that and, and use it some more. Now, one thing we might want to change is, OK, there's, a, uh, there's a, an error in this data set in that one of the players um, is not playing for the country, uh, for the specific country that it lists. So we have a fixed data set that we can load in. And what we might want to do is go down to that initial, uh, to that last sort of checking for a country piece, right? But unfortunately, that, that check is actually referencing a data set that hasn't been renamed, right? I did this extra step in between. And by scrolling to the result very quickly, trying to get to, you know, find me all the Brazilian players in the updated data set, I skipped a step in between. Um, and so what I have, would have to do is actually go back and either run all from the top or run all the cells from that initial fix that I ran all the way down to what I wanted, right? And that can still lead to, to potential issues. OK, so referencing intermediate results, there are uses for them. They work well in, the, uh, in, in sort of the, the console version of, or the standard version of IPython. Um, but this strategy of using the output dictionary to store results using numeric cell IDs, that's problematic because these cell IDs change when things are re-executed. Strategy of using the underscore variables to reference last results, that's a problem of out-of-order execution, right? So it's not what you see previously, it's what you last executed. And the strategy of global variables works pretty well. You just have to worry about, again, some out-of-execution things. Or if you're mutating that value in different cells to different values, which one last ran, you sort of have to keep track of that in your head. So one piece of the, the solution that we thought about is, why do we keep changing these identifiers when things get rerun, right? Why not just have sort of a persistent, unique identifier? So assign each cell an ID when it's created, maintain that ID forever. Close the notebook, you reopen it, it's still the same ID. Um, and that way, we can reference old cells in a way that won't change when we restart the notebook. 
Uh, and we didn't want to imply any sort of order to these IDs, so we used sort of random numbers. So that if you move cells up and down, you know, there, there's not a whole lot. Uh, you're not supposed to infer anything that cells one up is above a cell two or below cell three. So we use random integers, um, and we wrote them in hex to make them look more, I don't know, techy or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and you get a, a slightly changed notebook where you have the input and it's got this hexadecimal representation and then the output has the same hexadecimal representation. And we said, great, we can persistently reference cells. This is going to be a big win. Uh, and then we thought about it a little bit and said, well, who's going to remember these identifiers? Who's going to want to type these identifiers, right? Oh yeah, cell 51DO3E, that was that one where I squared 12. Um, no, that's, that's not the way people think. That's not the way people want to work. Uh, and so we thought about it a little harder and we said, what do we want to happen? We want people to be able to name their variables to be whatever they want them to be, right? So if you output a particular value and you want to name it as DF or cat or whatever you want, you can name it the way you want and use those names as reference in other cells. Don't have to reference some made up number um, for it. Okay, so what does this allow us, these persistent IDs? Uh, well, we don't need the linear uh, top-down notebooks anymore because we're referencing specific cells that aren't gonna change. So um, if, as long as we sort of point to the right places, we can execute the cells as needed, right? So we can, we can run the cells in the right order. We have these unique references since each variable is output um, once by a particular cell. And then we know which cells need to be rerun to allow a cell to execute. That once piece is something I'm gonna come back to, right? So you're only allowed to sort of set a value to a variable once. Um, and then we can sort of recurse up the chain. And this is similar to data flows, something I worked a lot in. I did scientific workflows and things like that. So you know, this, this was great for me. Uh, it's also similar to sort of functional programming. Uh, a cell waits for its inputs to be up to date, may involve executing things of, sort of that it depends on, and then it executes. So this data flow idea, you can draw nice pictures of them, sort of a set of computational modules. There are connections between the outputs of one uh, module to the inputs of another module, and then the execution can sort of happen bottom up. Um, so you have these things of upstream dependencies where things have to execute before I can execute the, the cell that I'm interested in, or downstream dependencies where if I execute the cell, what's gonna change? So let's just pivot this and term something data flow notebooks, where we basically just replace the name module with cell, right? So instead of having these computational modules, we're going to treat our cells sort of like these modules, right? They're going to have, uh, they're going to take inputs from other cells. They're going to have outputs um, for those cells. And then we have the same sort of terminology in that the execution can happen recursively. We have upstream and downstream cells. <coughs> All right, so how does this work, right? If I'm gonna sort of restrict variables and have these references fly around, um, we're gonna kind of wall off cells from each other. We'll put them in a closure. And that'll keep variables local to a single cell. And this would be great, except you can't get anything out of the cell then. You build a wall around the cell, nothing comes out of it. So we make an exception in that the last line of the cell uh, whatever outputs are either uh, listed as an, a tuple, an expression, or assigned to as a tuple, um, those become sort of elevated to this output status. Those can be referenced from other cells. And because of this, we have to sort of disallow duplicate outputs, right? So if A is output from two different cells, we don't know which one you're trying to refer to when you refer to A in another cell. So we say one output uh, or an output can only occur in one cell. Um, but you can still have unnamed outputs. So if you just want to sort of plot something or calculate something and you don't care about referencing it later on, um, you can just type an expression and it'll generate the plot, it'll generate the, the value. Right? And you, if you want, you can even connect those via those hexadecimal ideas. So those out of uh, hexadecimal ad identifier thing will work. The other piece is, okay, you can output things from the cells, but you need precise connections between those cells then, right? How do I connect an output from one cell to an input in another cell? So the great thing is you just write your code as normal, right? If you output something by a particular name and you want to reference that, you type the variable's name. Um, and then we figure out inside of the cell how to connect the value that you're trying to reference to the upstream cell. And because it's in another cell, 
we can do this same sort of recursive execution. So if you haven't executed the upstream cell, um, we point to that cell, we can execute that cell, make sure things are up to date, and then run the next cell. Um, and this is important because the notebook sort of gets to know when cells are stale. Something upstream's changed, right? So you change something that can impact all kinds of stuff in your notebook. You want to know about that, right? You don't want to just sort of be like, oh, I changed this value. What might have changed? Well, I could do run all, but I don't want to run all. I want to run only the things that are affected by that, right? And this is something that we can do if we have this data flow structure to uh, the notebook. Okay, so what does this actually look like? Um, here's, here's sort of a notebook in this data flow world. Uh, you can see the nice hexadecimal identifiers, these persistent identifiers. Remember, they're not going to change as the notebook executes. We also have named outputs. So when you generate an output, instead of seeing out of some identifier, we'll actually just put the name of the variable that's output. And then you also have unnamed outputs. So if you don't specify a name, um, either in an assignment or an expression, We'll just use whatever the ID of the cell is. And the connection then is done by variable reference. So you can see that I'm using some of those names that were output in other cells in some of the later cells. All right, so you might be wondering how does this actually work? Um, what we settled on was sort of creating a new kernel, uh, basing it on the IPy kernel and making some updates to it to sort of support this uh, data flow style execution. Uh, we modify sort of both the interface and the execution, right? Because we have to have these weird identifiers. We're changing how the output looks instead of just having these numeric cell IDs. So there's some hacking and extensions to the notebook as well. Some of it gets a little ugly. Um, some more details. We're using a custom namespace to intercept the variable access. Um, and this custom namespace is sort of listening for these global, these outputs of other cell references, right? So you reference A that was output in a cell somewhere else. Figuring out where to get that output from is what happens um, when you hit the namespace, when you're looking up a variable in locals. Uh, and so what that allows us to do is run any upstream dependencies, run the cell, and pull out the specific input. Um, so you don't have to have a single output per cell. The example that I showed only shows a single output, but you can have multiple outputs per cell. And so we may have to pull out just one of the outputs that's generated from a cell. We can also cache outputs so that they don't have to be recomputed, right? So if you've already run something, nothing about those cells has changed. There's no reason to rerun that cell, probably, assuming it's a deterministic style computation. Um, and then some other dirty details is we're, we're sort of augmenting the run AST nodes. We're looking at the abstract syntax tree that's um, parsed out of the code. And we wrap that in a closure. And then we customize the execution of the last line so that the closure returns those internal variables so that they can be promoted to be accessed from other cells. Um, and we sort of wrap it in this structure so that we can track things, a structure that has both a reference to the cell and the name of the output that we want. OK, so that's a lot of the details. Um, you know, what does this mean? What does this help in terms of understanding things, right? You've added these things, but how do I actually understand the notebooks now? Um, and so this is something that um, after we sort of put this thing together, it seemed to work. We said, what, what can we actually learn about the notebooks? Can we see what's going on with our notebooks better? And one of the things we thought about was, can we add sort of statuses for cells, right? Things like this cell is new, or this cell has never been executed, but I've added some content to it. Or instead of having the, the identifier change to an asterisk, maybe we'll just make a nice icon that shows executing. Um, and then green and red indicate you know, things are good or things are bad. So exceptions have happened in a particular cell, or this cell has run successfully, and it's still up to date. Right? So if something happened with an upstream cell that modifies uh, or that, that may affect the downstream cell, we have to be aware of that. Um, and so that's what this exclamation point icon, this stale um, status icon sort of tells us is something changed that may affect your output in this cell, right? So you know that something might have changed. You may need to re-execute this cell. And then we have a couple other things for specifically for when you save a notebook and you reopen it. Um, assuming everything executed right the last time, 
probably going to execute right this time, right? You can sort of say this, this is probably a check mark or this was an exception the last time. Put it in yellow because it's not certain. You may be running this notebook in a different environment, you may be running it two years later with different versions of packages, things like that. Um, along with that, we wanted to sort of give a view of how things connect, right? So you may have this mental map of what variables were output from a particular cell and what variables are used in a particular cell, but wouldn't it be nice to actually see that better? Um, and so this, we added a toolbar um, to the data flow of cells that let us look at the names of the variables um, and also select all of the upstream or all of the downstream. That's what the arrow icons there are. So um, those arrow icons allow us to select all of the upstream or downstream cells. Uh, we show the input variable names in blue and the output variable names in red. Um, and then there's a couple other icons um, that we've been experimenting with. Uh, one of them is force cached. Uh, the idea that, hey, I have a, a, a cell that's going to run for an hour. I don't want that to be automatically updated just because some parameter at the top changed, right? When I rerun it, sort of for my final analysis, you can re-execute it, but I don't want you automatically rerunning that cell specifically, right? And so that allows you to sort of force the cached version. It'll keep the icons as yellow in that case because you're not necessarily correct if you were to rerun that notebook in a later session, um, but it allows you to sort of experiment and play around with making things work before running that hour-long cell or you know even 10-minute long cell. And then the last icon is, is what we've called auto refresh, but probably is more familiar in a sort of a reactive mode. Um, so the idea is, can I rerun a cell if it becomes stale, right? So any cell, I change something upstream of it, can I just have it update, right? I don't have to wait for things to, you know, okay, it's yellow, I need to go update it, just have it automatically update so I don't even have to worry about it. And then finally, we thought, well, this is a graph, so let's throw it into graph viz and create a nice graph. Um, we use the, the JavaScript um, version of this, viz.js, to sort of generate this graph so we can display it in the browser. Um, but this allows us to show connections between the cells. You can see more of sort of the layout of, you know, if I change this cell, what cells are affected in sort of a more global view than having to scroll up and down in the notebook. <laughs> um, and one of the cool things is we have the same colors to sort of indicate when things are stale, when things have been executed correctly, when there are exceptions, um, but it's also linked to the notebook. So if you hover over a particular cell, um, part of the window still shows the notebook and you can see the, the code associated with that cell. Um, and you can also sort of do some executions and other operations in the graph instead of in the notebook. Okay, so we've gotten to that point in time where I'm gonna attempt to do a demo. So here is uh, a notebook. Um, I'm using the digits data set, doing some machine learning on that. If you were in the previous session, you've seen much of this uh, before. Um, but what I'm doing at the top is I'm importing some libraries. Um, one thing you'll note is I'm actually putting the names of those libraries as outputs so that I can reference them from other cells. Um, now, this seems a little clunky in that if you're importing libraries, why shouldn't they just be available in every cell, right? So there is a shortcut here. If I don't actually import those, we have a configuration option that says automatically import the libraries, make those global all the time, right? Because that's generally going to be the case. If you import a library, you don't want to have to sort of specify which cells it's going to be used in. Um, and then what we can do is load in the digits data set. Um, and one thing you'll notice about the digits data set is it comes in as a dictionary with uh, various fields, so the data, the target, the images, things like that. Uh, one thing we thought about is adding a magic command here specifically for mappings like this where we can split things out. So multiple outputs we saw in um, the modules up here, you can see instead of just a single output, I'm naming four different outputs. Same thing then can happen with this data where I can get four different out or five different outputs here, right? The data, the target, the target names, the images, and then the description at the end. All right, and I can collapse this um, so that I don't have to see it all the time. Um, so one thing I might want to see is, is maybe a visualization of some of the training data. Um, and in this case, I'm referencing a function, make plots. Um, in this case, uh, one thing you'll note, if I run this directly, is it says, oh, make plots is not defined. Um, and so that's because I put make plots as a method down here. Um, if I define it and then go back oops, to the original cell, 
Um, then I can run that. It's going to give me a matplotlib or, um, output that shows sort of the training data set, how we have the labeled um, names, um, and that's how we're going to be training this algorithm. Okay, uh, we can do a test train split. So in this case, we'll split things into x train, x test, uh, um, y train, y test. You'll note that I'm doing an assignment here. I've done this before, um, but the assignment is actually setting these output variables. So that last line, uh, IPython in a recent release sort of added this mode where you could have assignment expressions also be output um, as well as sort of the last expression, which is the normal case in IPython. Um, and so we sort of extended this and say, well, if you output a tuple, let's show the, all of those outputs as names that can be referenced in later cells. Okay, now to the fun stuff. Let's create a uh, SV, uh, SVM classifier. Um, and then I can run through some stuff to generate expected and predicted. Um, I can look at, oh, again, I forgot to run this function, PD scores, which will generate me a nicer table um, from the F scores. Go back and rerun that. Uh, I can do a confusion matrix. All right. And then finally, what I might want to see is how does this thing work, right? Test it off on a few of these um, of these examples. Um, and I should mention this is building on um, Gael Veracroix's um, original example. So if this looks familiar, you've seen it in the scikit-learn documentation, it's coming from there. Okay, so now I've executed the cells in the notebook. Um, one thing I might want to do now is, is play around with this gamma value, right? And so one thing I'll do is maybe I'll set it to 0.001. Um, and what you notice is those status icons now change, right? So instead of all being green, I now see a bunch of yellow in here. And this is notifying me that all of these things um, in yellow may be affected by that change. Um, the things above are still green. Um, but I can go and jump directly to the thing I care about, was, which is, can I see if this changes on some of the, the, the random prediction data, right? And what happens is it, will, it knows, the notebook knows because of all the references, this data flow graph that it's set up, um, which things to execute. And you'll notice the confusion matrix didn't need to be re-executed, right? This example doesn't depend on the confusion matrix. Um, so that doesn't have to be re-executed. But the other pieces in terms of generating the expected and predicted data um, do have to be re-executed, right? And we can see this changes some of the predictions. We see a nine here instead of an eight and a six here instead of an eight. Um, so another thing, to, to note is the toolbar for the data flow. <coughs> um, and so if I go to something like the classifier, or maybe expected predicted is a better one, right? What you can see again here is I can highlight everything upstream, all the cells that sort of impact the, uh, the classifier as inputs. Um, and then I can see that this classifier is what the output is, the named output that's generated, right? That's fairly clear from the last cell, but this gives you sort of a nice way to look at things. Um, right. Um, so one other piece is uh, what I'd like to do is show what happens when you, uh, so if I save this notebook and then I think I have to generate a new tab before I close it, otherwise I'll lose things. I'll close this notebook um, and then I'll go back and reopen it. Um, so here, everything shows up with these yellow icons because I don't know if things are correct anymore, right? This could be me opening the notebook two years later. Um, and so what I, what I can still do, though, is if I scroll down to sort of the main thing that I care about, which might be what do the predictions look like, um, I can just run that from sort of a cold state. And because the notebook has stored information about what the dependency graph looks like, for, um, it can automatically figure out what needs to be rerun at that time. So once you've done it once, it persists sort of that state, those connections between the cells, so that when you open it again in another session or somebody else opens it, um, they don't have to go through and sort of worry about um, at which cells need to be executed, which cells don't need to be executed. Okay. Uh, so that's the, the demo. There's one other demo that I wasn't going to try live, so I recorded this instead. Um, but I think I've talked about how interaction is, is a nice feature in the notebooks, right? And so widgets are kind of cool. So we thought, well, if we have this data flow thing, what would it look like? What would we sort of ideally like it to look like for widgets? Um, so here we have a matplotlib plot showing some Boston housing data, uh, sort of the percentage of homes built before 1940 in different tracks. Um, and so I can run that cell. 
it uses stuff below it. But what I'd like to add now is a widget, if I can type quickly, um, where, where I sort of set what the number of bins are for the histogram so that I can explore the different bin widths for the histogram. Uh, so I'll create an int slider, have it range from 0 to 10 starting at 5. Um, and now I can add that bins reference directly into the plot and rerun it. Um, but now if I click on this auto refresh piece, what's going to happen is as I move the widget, right now it just updates those cells automatically. And if there were more cells in between, it would run everything that it needed to to get to that final output. Right. Assuming they were all refreshable cells. Um, so this sort of, you know, we changed it, hacked a few things about IPy widgets in that um, we use a specific piece so that the output shows up as an output. There's a mime bundle branch that uses that. Um, and then we also sort of took away the dot value piece um, and looked at just naming the variable as it is. We assume when you're referencing a widget and it sort of says bins next to it, you don't want to do bins dot value. So we just added a quick hack to get at that. Um, but we think this is sort of another nice use case for these interactive sides uh, of using the data flow. All right, so there are some known issues. You're not surprised at this. Some of you were probably thinking about all the things that can go wrong in this case. Um, and you're right for some of them, right? If you mutate an output, you do that at your own peril. Um, something that's uh, sort of an object, right, where you're modifying the internals of an object that was output from some other cell. Um, if you have nested references, those can introduce issues. Um, there's also an interesting case by overriding the namespace. If you're accessing the globals directly via C Python, that can be problematic. Things like static class variable assignments. Um, and then things like multiple interfaces to the same kernel uh, that I've seen a little bit demoed. Um, something we haven't even thought about. But generally, we're trying to connect the interface a little bit closer to what the kernel is. And so we're probably not succeeding on any front there. Um, one thing we do have that we think would be useful is that you can convert your DF kernel notebook to a standard IPy kernel notebook. Right? So basically, we can sort things in the right way so you get the run all top down type of um, execution style. So we're not the only people thinking about this. There's cool related work that's going on. Um, something I just saw recently is Reactive Pi, a kernel that does the same sort of reactive computation. Um, and it's just a kernel. They don't have to modify the interface. It runs in JupyterLab, pretty cool. Um, also Nodebook, um, where you use a more sort of bigger restriction on the cell order defining the execution order. Um, there's some cool reactive notebooks in the JavaScript world from Observable. Um, JetBrains has this data lore tool that kind of works, looks at incremental computation as well. Um, and then Mathematica, um, you know, which has you know, always been associated with sort of the same notebook idea, has this dynamic um, command that has similar sort of reactive functionality. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who worked on this, Colin Brown, um, Henry Nuo. They spent lots of their summer coding away, trying to make this stuff work. Um, Jay was involved in an earlier version of this. Um, and the Jupyter and IPython development teams, the way they sort of allow these extensions to be built and the extensibility that's in their products is really useful in order to try out some of this stuff, right? So it speaks to the documentation, the structure of the code that we can do these sorts of things. Um, this was supported by the State Street Foundation, um, and the photos used in the presentation are attributed. Um, there's a website, dataflownb.github.io. We've been trying to push out a beta version. It will be there soon if it's not there right now. Um, and you can try this out then uh, from that website. Um, and that is what I have. I'd be happy to take a couple questions if there's time. So it causes a duplicate name error. Um, so it, it won't let you do it, basically. Um, so if I were to do something like try to define make plots equals, oops, make plots equals three, um, I'll get this duplicate name error, letting me know that it's already been defined in another cell. Yep. Right. Um, so probably things that are already very functional in their design would, would sort of carry over in the kernel um, space. I don't know how all the hooks um, sort of would carry over, but I imagine there are ways to do it. 
Um, with Jupyter Lab, um, there's some I sat in some nice sessions on how to build extensions. Um, I think the idea we would look at would be taking sort of the original notebook again and sort of modifying that and building it as sort of a, a second version of the notebook as an extension, if that's possible. Um, but it, it looks like that extensibility is supported. So I think that would be the direction we'd go in for Jupyter Lab, and we're thinking about that. Yes. A couple of questions. I, I love this stuff. Uh, one, have you looked at static analysis of the hmm. code to remove the constraint that you have to specify the variables in the end? Right. And the second one, have you thought about automated parallelization since you have the mm -hmm. data? So the second one, no. I, I, we know that since you have a data flow graph, this would be something to look at. We haven't thought about it at all. Um, for the first piece, the static analysis, so that uh, reactive pi project, I think uses sim table to try to do a static analysis to figure that out. Um, that's something we weren't aware of. Um, one thing, I think that by doing it in the dynamic analysis, we can do things like split a dictionary and things like that that may be kind of useful. Um, but you can probably do some nice um, task using static analysis as well. I don't know. How are we doing it? Okay. Uh, maybe one more question and then we have to wrap it up. I don't know who. Sure. Uh, are you taking care of bags in the data flow? So if you're referring to multiple flows and then it comes back something. So a cyclic cycle? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we try to detect those cycles. Yes. Um, and, and generate a cyclic, some sort of cyclic exception. So. All right. Thank you very much.